We are really excited tonight to be uh, sharing the stage with two minds that are absolutely brilliant when it comes to e-commerce and fintech in general. And really hope that tonight will brighten your evening. We're, we're apology, apologies for the technical glitches, but this night is going to end on a high. So I'm not gonna waste any time speaking about myself. I am going to go right ahead into introducing tonight's speakers. Um, I have the privilege of sharing the stage tonight with Jonathan Smith, who is the MD and founder of PayFast. So a lot of you, if you haven't already heard of this brilliant man, Jonathan at heart is an entrepreneur. He actually founded uh, PayFast very early in his career in 2007, after gaining some valuable experience from business and engineering consulting firms. And if you didn't know, he actually holds a degree in computer engineering. Jonathan's really passionate about all things technical. Um, this includes things such as the internet and disrupted systems. And if you, if you are very curious, you might know that Jonathan um, actually personally developed the core PayFast platform himself. He has been very instrumental. Sorry, there's somebody's um, Zoom that is not on mute. I'm just going to kind of ask that if you are online with us, that you just mute. Otherwise, there's um, a feedback. Um, as I was saying about Jonathan, Jonathan has been very instrumental in leading PayFast to becoming one of um, South Africa's most recognized payment processing companies. And if you if you you know if you've just kept up with PayFast progress, you will know that they're quite a recognized brand in South Africa. Um, but I'm not just having Jonathan on stage, we're also joined by Marius Ritz, who is the general manager for Africa at LUNO. Um, Marius obviously is the GM of LUNO. And if you have not heard of LUNO already, LUNO is Africa's largest cryptocurrency exchange. And it is one of the leading cryptocurrency exchanges in the world. In fact, even though Luna was only founded in 2013, to date it's got over 7 million customers. Um, that, that those were the current numbers as of 7 June 2021. And today it has nearly 400 employees stretched from uh, London, South Africa, Malaysia, uh, India, Nigeria, uh, Singapore, and 40 other countries globally. Um, I'm just going to ask that if you do, if you are joining us, welcome and we welcome you, but will you kindly please just mute so that um, we don't have the playback in the background. And yeah, with that, I'm just going to ask Marius and Jonathan to join me as we have a discussion around FinTech. During the course of our discussion, if you have questions that you want to either direct generally to the panel or um, directly to Jonathan or either Marius, just feel free to um, message us on the chat box and I will direct those questions directly to them. Um, without further ado, um, Jonathan and Marius, like, you know, FinTech and commerce tends to be a very intimidating space for the average person who's not involved in FinTech and e-commerce. Um, if you don't mind, um, let's say, Jonathan, can you give us an overview of what exactly are we speaking about when we speak about fintech and e-commerce? And if you can share your experience of how has how have you personally experienced the space of fintech and e-commerce, let's say from the time you're in varsity to 2007 when you founded PayFast, to date, what are some of the impressive updates that have really um, shown that there's been um, a continuous development? And then Marius, after Jonathan has answered that, perhaps you can then take it on from a cryptocurrency aspect, just by providing clarity as to how cryptocurrency fits in into e-commerce and fintech. And what are we actually talking about when we talk about cryptocurrency decentralized systems, digital currency, if you could shed light on that. And if, if just like Jonathan, if you can sort of shed light from the first time you actually heard about cryptocurrency and the development to now being the, uh, the general manager of Luno. So Jonathan, over to you. Great, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sinclair. Um, that is a, a very um, 
That's a, well, I don't know, it's a longish question, which is going to have an even longer answer. <laughs> but um, yeah, look, I think, you know, what, what FinTech um, really is all about is that, uh, you know, historically, call it, um, I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe a bit less than that, really, uh, the banks, uh, the very well established financial institutions kind of held all the keys, they had all the cards, right? Uh, and that's why they were so big and so successful um, and, uh, and so trusted, right? And kind of as, as time has moved on with the evolution of the internet, with, with various other things, only but surely there's pieces that banks have always done that are, that are starting to be done by, by external, external companies, right? or external to the bank at least, right? And that's across the entire value chain. You know, if you look at a bank, a bank will do, um, you know, depositing, they'll do lending, they'll do payment processing, they'll do all manner of different things, right? You would know this, you know, coming from a banking background yourself, right? There are so many different things um, that a bank does. And really what's happened as, as these things are opening up more and more, um, these components are being taken over and, and, and uh, attacked in a different way by a number of different companies. Doesn't have to be a bank, doesn't necessarily require a banking license. You know, you can see this in terms of uh, payments, you know, it is one, right? You can see the, the evolution of probably the, the first, um, you know, fintechs where, where payment companies be that Stripe, PayPal, Adyen, you know, Payfast, whoever, right? There's so many different companies that are taking on that one aspect that used to kind of belong in the banking world. Um, you can look at, at anything else. You can look at insurance, you can look at financing, merchant capital advance, you know, something that that has been taken on by, by external parties as well. In South Africa, we have really good companies that do this, retail capital, merchant capital. Uh, you can look at uh, other markets. You can have things like cabbage. You know, there, there, there's so many of these things, right? So I think, you know, when we talk about fintech, that is kind of what we're talking about, right? Is the, um, the, the evolution of non-banking entities which are taking on, you know, uh, components of business that were traditionally dominated by by banking and large financial institutions. You know, if you're talking, uh, and, and that, that really has been something that has just grown dramatically in the last, um, you know, 15 odd years in, in my my experience in terms of um, of digital and online and payments. I mean, you know, my my specific area of, you know, as people would would know, I would I would think is is around e-commerce and yeah. uh, online payments. And obviously there we've seen a dramatic growth um, in, in the last number of years, uh, particularly accelerated by COVID in the last, the last year or two. Um, but even before then, strong growth, right? Uh, you know, the rest of the world uh, is a lot further along than we are in South Africa, um, but we're catching up and there's good growth ahead, right? But, uh, you know, 10, 10, 12, 14 odd years ago, it was nascent, not very much happening at all, really, really early days. Uh, even five to 10 years ago, it was still pretty small, but uh, really it's, it's grown dramatically in the last, uh, you know, circa five years and, and massive uh, shot of adrenaline to the arm um, with, uh, with the likes of the COVID pandemic, um, you know, f around the world, but especially in South Africa as well. Hopefully that answers uh, your question no. to a large degree. Definitely. No, thank you for that, Jonathan. I think like, um, even though I'm part of Gen Z, so I didn't really grow up in a stage where like my parents would have had to wake up early in the morning to go and deposit money and really actually interact with the bank. So there's definitely been a lot of growth and development. And in the banking sector, it's just made um, financing and banking a lot accessible and a lot more efficient. And so, Marius, that kind of brings me to you like... 20 years ago, we weren't speaking about cryptocurrency. We weren't speaking about operating outside of an existing banking system. Everything was a centralized system. Where does the idea of digital currency and um, cryptocurrency emanate from? And why is it so important that we operate outside of, a, outside of the conventional banking system? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, that's that's a loaded question. <laughs> Hopefully, no central bankers in the room tonight. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. I, th I think you know the, the the topic of cryptocurrency can be very complex. Or people tend to you know overcomplicate things. Um, I think you know at a very fundamental level. I think if we look back over the last couple of thousands of years, the way that the world thinks about and uses money. Uh, has changed many times in the past. Um, and I think the exciting part is that now, for the first time, we actually get to live one of, uh, through one of those changes. Um, no, and I think we see this change because there's a change in mindset, and it links into FinTech as well. There's a change in mindset 
Uh, there's this quote saying that you know dollar bills and, and gold coins only have value you know, common imagination, right? So people start to think differently about money and, and what they can do with money. I think, I think secondly, um, we're seeing a change in consumer trends. Uh, consumers have become a bit more tech savvy. Um, and I think in that regard, the, you know, as we refer to this, the, the existing financial system, uh, fiat money was built for the non-digital age. Um, consumers have become more tech savvy. They demand things instantly for free, customized to, to their personal needs. And then I think lastly, the last component to fintech or crypto is technology. You know, technology is often the enabler of progress. Uh, and I think, um, you know, in our world, we see cryptocurrency as technology and as an enabler to allow us to upgrade the existing financial, to um, upgrade the financial system to something that's better. And the interesting part, when we, when we talk to banks and, and regulators and, and fintech companies and you know, challenger banks, I think everyone agrees that you know, um, money can do more. You know, money can money should be should should it, it should be easier to move money around. It should be cheaper to move money around. Uh, it, it should be you know there should be more secure ways in which you can transact, etc. But I think you know where we sometimes tend to disagree is how we will get there. You now you have challenger banks and, and, and Amazon and all these companies trying their own thing. We at Lino we're doing exactly the same thing. You know we also think that um, it should be. You know, it should be easier to move money around. It should be more interoperable. It should be safer. Um, but we think instead of using, uh, you know, instead of just optimizing, you know, the existing banking payment rails, for example, we think something left field, something new, like a cryptocurrency, decentralized cryptocurrency, um, you know, will allow us to achieve that. Now, you know, people often ask, what is a cryptocurrency? And I think, you know, it's often easier explained. And I'm, I've been a billionaire for six years and I still, um, I still, you know, I'm not able to explain this you know, in, a, in a very easy to understand way. <laughs> so, so bear with me. But I think, um, you know, people often understand things when you compare to something that they're familiar with, right? So in the world of crypto, let's use Bitcoin, for example. Um, you now, Bitcoin is public payments infrastructure. It's peer-to-peer it's -peer money. And if you compare that to something we know like cash, for example, cash is also public payments infrastructure, you know, cash transaction is peer to peer, you know, you, but the downside of cash is that, um, you know, you, you need to meet someone, you have to meet someone in person in order to transact, in order to exchange value. There's no intermediary uh, involved in a cash transaction, there's no bank, you know, it's just you and other party, so there's no handling fee, uh, but there's some friction, right, because it's an, it's an in-person transaction. So, crypto, you know, you can think of it in a very similar way, it's, it's, it's peer to peer money, there's no central person um, that's controlling that transaction, but it's it's digital, so it's scalable. Um, and um, I think I think we 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 have you know similar systems for information, um, transfer of information for telecommunications, but money really is the only large scale system used by humanity that really hasn't you know gone through that same same evolution if you want to call it that. So I think, uh, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, if you look back to 2013, 14, 15, crypto was the wild west. Uh, it was largely unregulated. Um, you know, it was, there was a zero tolerance approach toward crypto, from a, especially from financial institutions and banks. And we've grown to 2021 where we've seen institutional adoption this year, the likes of PayPal into this space. They're making access to cryptocurrencies easier. Um, we've seen regulations come to many markets, uh, including you know, in South Africa, there's lots of progress on that front as well. We've seen, you know, we've had lots of progress. Less biased uh, report, um, you know, um, and so I, I think we've had enough science, uh, enough momentum in the crypto market to say that it's probably yet to stay. We don't yet know whether Bitcoin is going to be, you know, the crypto that's going to, uh, you know, be used widely in the next 10, 20, 30 years. But we think given Bitcoin's track record, it's got the best chance of, of, of surviving compared to some other coins. Thanks, Marius, for that overview. I think you've highlighted a lot of things. Um, like my most key takeaway, usually when people also ask me what cryptocurrency is, I struggle to explain that. But that peer-to-peer -peer transaction, I think, breaks it down so um, so well to understand that there's no intermediary between the two parties involved. But with that being said, we actually have a question from an old 
uh, yeah, sorry, from Tepang Bering, who I happen to know, who's asking this question is directed to you, um, which is his question is what is sorry, my question is what what is Luno doing to bring crypto closer to consumers and businesses like FNB did with eBucks? Um, so that's a question directed to you from Tepang Bering. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and I think that is. Our, uh, our, um, our, our main focus at this point is to make access to cryptocurrency easier. Um, crypto, you know, as I said, can be quite a complex uh, subject and, and I think cryptocurrency companies tend to overestimate the, the level of knowledge that the general public has around cryptocurrency. So I think you know, our objective now, and we have to acknowledge that um, you know, access to the cryptocurrency industry is not you know, as easy as it should be. It's not you know, that obvious for the average person you know, sitting in the restaurant to, to know, okay, I need to go here and there in order to buy crypto. And that's how it works, right? So that is our core focus at this point. You know, we think crypto will play an important role in the future. Um, it'll be, you know, people will start using it in their, every, in their everyday lives. Not now, but in the next 10, 15 years. But right now, the current need is for people to have safe and easier access to crypto in order to buy crypto with the local currency. So we obviously work very closely with, with banks and financial institutions to um, build that bridge between the banking system and the cryptocurrency uh, system. Um, and I think where a lot of companies uh, in the crypto space struggle with is on the educational front. I think that's where, that's where you have to start. So we've invested a lot of time on the educational front, not only um, trying to educate and, 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 and work with our customers and the public, but also with regulators and financial institutions. So I think once we have that, almost want to say critical mass of people with a basic understanding of, of, of crypto um, and owning cryptocurrency, I think we're going to you know, see adoption increase and, and liquidity fix kicking. Thanks, um, Marius, for that. Um, Jonathan, coming back to you, I think Marius, um, in his answer, raised quite um, a few pertinent questions around the challenges of operating in fintech and e-commerce that a lot of it has to go to education. It's also about educating regulators. I remember that there was like uh, for a long time in the uh, cryptocurrency space, there was a debate whether uh, cryptocurrency was actually a currency or was it a, uh, uh, like what, how did you begin to define that? But that brings me to my question for you, Jonathan, which is, what are the main um, barriers for um, fintech startups that are looking to enter the space, especially if you can provide context in the payment solution space? Would you say that Africa is, or South Africa in, in particular, is a challenging environment for startups to test and scale fintech ideas? Or do you think that actually, you know, South Africa and Africa is right? For, for, for testing these um, fintech ideas? Uh, I think my, my general answer in this regard would be that any um, starting any, any fintech venture or any, uh, anything to do with, uh, with financials is quite difficult. I don't think it matters where you are in the world. Money is, uh, is an, incredible, an incre incredibly critical part of, of life. And there are a lot of laws, regulations, um, and directives around it, right? So, you know, while we have all these challenger banks and, and fintech starting and all the rest of it, I think that, that any of this is fraught with complexity and risk, depending on, on, on what you take on. It is not something uh, kind of entered into, entered into lightly these days. You know, you generally need to be, either know what you're doing or be relatively well-funded. Um, you know, it, it, it is it is complex. It's a complex uh, a complex sphere to, to get involved in. And also, it's it's one of those things where you've got to build trust, right? People don't trust you. You know, if you're trying to, if you're handling their money and you don't have their trust, they're, they're not going to. People are not going to give you their money, right? Um, and it takes. A, and sometimes the only thing that actually helps in that regard is time. Um, time in market is what builds trust. Uh, you know, a good brand and all the rest of it. And that's why we have such we place such trust in the institutions that have been around for so long because they've been around for so long, right? Um, but also because there are a lot of laws or, that protect us, you know? So this is why um, people, you know, trust, you know, you know, trust largely banks because there is a lender of last resort in the central, the central bank who will step in if a bank fails, right? 
Um, so there, there are a lot of challenges around this. So I think it's great that um, there is a global movement to having a lot more um, open access kind of to, to banking and to payments. And there have been you know, new developments in terms of technology. Uh, there is a lot that is opening up uh, what was once before very closed, you're right? There's there's movement, you know, movements. There's laws like PSD and PSD2 in in Europe and and other open open banking movements around the world. So I think it's all positive, but it is going to have um, some learning and some risk as we go along. As I think all of us, if we if we're talking about crypto, have seen in in, in the crypto world. You know, unfortunately, we can't go too too many uh, days, weeks, or months before hearing of some scam and people losing money and whatnot. You know, it, it, it does have that problem. Where um, you know people are operating in in what is a relatively unregulated area, and and there are challenges in that. Um, so I mean, it's good, but uh, it comes it comes with certain amounts of risk. Um, but we're all learning, right? Um, and I think this is true across any any um, part of fintech or or change in the way we we handle money and we process payments and we we transact natively you know as that as that changes um so you know it takes a while for for regulation and whatnot to catch up with that and to maybe bring some of the security that's needed to make it more mainstream yeah thanks jonathan for that i actually want uh, marius to contrast your answer do you think that especially in your type of space with cryptocurrency exchange is it difficult building trust and if it if it's not if you're finding that actually gaining trust from your um, customers is not that hectic can you explain how does one go about building trust especially if people are so used to um, relying on existing institutions that have been there for hundreds of years and we know that there's regulations that protect customers with cryptocurrency you kind of entering a space where governments are sort of um, learning on the go as to how to regulate that space and protect consumers? I can promise you it's hectic uh, to go to public trust as a, as, a, as a business operating in the crypto market. It's, it's not easy. Um, I think the first thing, again, you know, involves around regulation. Um, and you point to existing financial institutions. They have track records of things, you know, hundreds of years. If you look at assets such as gold, for example, commodities, gold has a you know, thousand, thousands of years of track record now. So, so it's very difficult. Um, I think what we did at Lino was from very, very early on uh, decided to follow a you know, self-regulatory approach. So even in the absence of, of formal regulations for the market, we try to comply with as many as possible regulations that financial institutions have to um, have to follow. So for example, back in 2013, already Lino registered with the Financial Intelligence Center, um, and we started doing KYC in our customers and Complied with AMR. And I think that gives some customers uh, you know, a bit of comfort uh, because you, at the end of the day, keep your platform clean of bad actors. It's not obviously always possible, but at least there's a barrier to entry you know, for people wanting to use your platform for, for different reasons. Um, and then obviously security as well. You know, that's a that's a big, big, uh, big focus of ours. Um, now we at the end of the day, we we, we safeguard customer funds um, in the form of crypto. And people uh, don't understand this concept of magic internet money. So, you know, how do you safeguard it? So, we, we had to do you know, a lot on that front to ensure that you know, we've never had any hacks, uh, never had any security breaches on Lino. And I think over time that builds trust um, as well. Um, and then, lastly, I think customer support. I think that that was very tricky scaling that, especially in the crypto world, because of you know new concepts and new technical jargon and new you know, uh, concepts that you're dealing with, right? And, and your team has to be able to comfortably and with confidence communicate to to, to clients on, on these um, often complex topics. So I think um, you know from a customer support perspective, that's also very important you know, in terms of conveying trust and, and in terms of you know, maintaining that relationship with your customers. So it's a combination of all of these things, but I think, you know, first and foremost, regulations, you know, doing, doing what you can from that respectable trust um, and security. You know, you, you need to build, build that function out. And you know, fortunately, we have a clean track record on that, um, in that regard. 100%. Actually, somebody as somebody who comes from a legal background, I definitely am with you on complying with regulations. Um, but I'm just going to redirect back to Jonathan. We have yes. a question from Jimmy Hong for you. Um, Jimmy Hong says, hi, Jonathan. 
Do you see South Africa opening up to neobank and other fintech ventures, or are the regulations here too restrictive? So um, that's a question from Jimmy Hong. Oh, for thanks for the question. Uh, just for anyone who doesn't uh, not familiar with the term, you know, the neo neo bank refers to a bank that doesn't have any physical branches, so it's kind of an online only only bank. Um, you know, I, I, the, South Africa's financial regulation is pretty 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 good, pretty tight. Um, but really, we we already have uh, uh, you know a neo bank. So uh, you know, the one that sort of springs to mind would be Time. So Time Bank, you know, has actually been doing well, signing up uh, millions of of consumers, and they lack uh, any physical branches. You know, they they interact through um, their terminals at uh, at pick and pay, but but that's it, right? So you know, it's already happening. You know, and if we think about challenger banks, we already have challenger banks in the likes of uh, Discovery, which has recently entered into uh, the banking realm. You know, not uh, uh, you know for them, uh, likely a very trusted institution, but a recent entrant into into banking. Uh, and there are a number of others as well, right? So we definitely are seeing uh, a shift. I mean, and even, you know, you could say that Capitec was a challenger bank, but now it's become far more established, right? It used to be always the, the big four banks in, in South Africa, and it's now kind of said the big five, and really you include Vestic in there as well, becomes the big six. If more and more, that's just kind of spread out, right? Um, and I mean, I know, I mean, personally, it's an occupational hazard. It, but I have a bank account with, with with a number of different banks just because I'm interested to see what their offering is. I think um, I can't even remember what the last count was, but probably ten or more different bank accounts. Um, so really, it's I think it's going to become far more um, prevalent that that consumers and businesses have, they have a lot more choice, and you will pick a bank, um, and you will you know according to what your needs are. And you might have more than one bank account, and you might choose to change that, uh, you know, frequently or not frequently, but but more often than you might have historically. I mean, I know that when growing up, I had a an account with one of the big four banks, and I had that account for sort of twenty years. You know, it didn't change, um, and I think a lot of people are kind of locked in that way. And I think that that is probably a relic of the past. Where now it's become a lot easier for us to change. It's become a lot easier for us, and 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 I think that is not it's not so sacrosanct anymore. Right, we will actually, as consumers, vote with our feet and go where we believe we're getting value, and uh, and and to an institution that speaks to our specific needs. And uh, I think there's just going to be more of those institutions going forward, and more choice for the consumer, which should ultimately be a good thing. Absolutely, I think the more uh, choices consumers have, the better, and it just creates a better competitive market, which at the end should put the consumer first. Um, we also have a question that's directed at Marius, and I'm going to come back to Jonathan. Um, we have a question uh, saying, on the topic of regulation, how fluid does Marius find the conversation is with regulators? Does he feel that, do you feel that the intention is tolerance, encouragement, or to stifle the growth and the use of crypto businesses? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And I think, you know, we have to put ourselves in the regulator's shoes, I think, as well. They're dealing with a with cryptocurrency and it's you know, it's something that they don't have really any knowledge on. It's something new. Um, and they have to try and you know protect consumers at the same time and, and try and, and you know fit it into existing uh, legacy regulatory frameworks. Right. So it's 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 a it's a it's a tough um, tough ask. I think in South Africa, we've moved beyond the you know, approach of no tolerance for crypto to one acknowledging, acknowledging that crypto will likely play a role in the future. Um, you know, we, we see an increased number of, of people opening Luna accounts and across other crypto platforms as well. And the real, you know, the, the thing about the crypto growth that we've experienced up until now, it's really been grassroots level growth, right? It doesn't come from the top down, it's come from the bottom up. Um, and when people find something, you know, more and more use in using crypto, for example, compared to the dollar or the euro for payments, you know, or for investment, um, or for whatever reason, then they will use it regardless of whether, um, you know, there's regulation or not. So, so I think the reserve banks moved beyond, you know, and, and they've realized that crypto is here to stay. Um, and... Um, they need to provide consumers with some protection you know, going forward. So it, it, it's been a fluid conversation, but obviously also to some degree, you know, at times frustrating because um, you know, crypto is a new, it's a global um, phenomenon. It knows no borders. And you, you know, especially 
from exchange control perspective, you have to try and fit it into SA's exchange control framework, which is proving to be you know, a, a big challenge. Thanks. Thanks, Marius, for um, responding to that. But also, I think people must also um, understand that regulators also try their best to actually ensure that people are able to thrive in e-commerce and in the fintech space. I mean, this year or last year alone, we saw how regulators were trying to um, get your Vodacoms um, in, in to bring down data prices. And this has also meant that the space is now more accessible for more people. Um, but going back to a question from Elijah addressed to, actually, no, sorry, Jimmy Hong um, asked for either one of you to answer this question. So I'll let either Jonathan or Marius decide who's comfortable with answering this question. But how do you see super apps doing in SA? Vodacom seems to be venturing into that space with Vodapay and partnership with Alipay. But is South Africa mature enough in terms of infrastructure and support? And again, that's an essential question. So I don't know if Jonathan, do you want to go first or do you want to hand it over to Marius? No, I'm happy, both can comment. happy to talk. Yeah, um, you know, it's... Uh... It's a tricky one. I um, I can't say that I'm uh, you know an expert on that. I don't really look too much at kind of the the concept of super apps and whatnot. But I think that one of the things you need in order to really have um, a super app is a really big customer base, right? A really dominant um, a dominant position in the market, good market share, right? And um, that is has always well has historically been a challenge in South Africa because we don't necessarily have a single dominant brand, dominant financial institution, right? We have a number. So market share is, is reasonably split between, between various, uh, various parties, right? So if you take the banks, for example, we've just talked about that. You've probably got six kind of major banks that each have a, a fairly good chunk um, of, of the market uh, and split between them. Take the cellular operators. Uh, you've got the same the same thing there, right? You've got Vodacom, MTN, uh, Celsi, uh, you know, one or two others in there. And um, yes, I mean, Vodacom is fairly dominant. I suppose if anyone can get it right, they probably have um, a, a good a good chance of it. Um, but because of the fact that we have no single really dominant party that has a huge market share, I, I have my doubts about um, a particular brand being able to to get that sort of super app status and get get the the right traction you know i, I suppose um a slight analogy in this regard would be um something like impeza um which has repeatedly failed to be launched in south africa you know as a, as a you know as mobile money um and part of the reason is because of banking regulation but also because of a lack of dominant market share you know when safaricom launched impeza in uh, in kenya they had i think upwards of between 80 and 90 percent market share which is one of the reasons why it was so successful amongst some other things in terms of technology so yeah, I, I'm circumspect about about any particular brand getting it right to develop uh, and and have a super act gain significant traction. Um, Marius, I don't know if you want to add on to Jonathan's answer. I think obviously, you know, the, the pro is that you know super app offers you a variety of services, um, but I think on the downside, um, you know, I think potentially. Um, you know, some of these super apps might be spread you know, across too many different verticals. And, and I think at the end of the day, it can become very, very difficult to, you know, to offer best in class service for any of those specific you know, um, areas. So I think you know, in South Africa, especially where we still have a very, very cash heavy economy, um, people using cash, uh, um, people you know, not you know, being to you know, the, the online banking environment, I, I see um, growth and adoption in the super app space. I know Vodacom is launching the, the super app and I think one or two others, NetBank as well. I haven't actually tracked the progress and, and tracked the adoption rates there, but I'd be surprised if you know, they're shooting the lights up. Um, I think it's still very, very early on you know, in South Africa. People still, you know, you know, most people still don't even access you know, the, the, the online um, banking apps. You know? So. I think it's, a, it's an interesting development. I think, you know, it, it gives people you know, a variety of, of options. But I think you know, at the end of the day, you know, the experts um, and, and the companies offering standalone apps probably, you know, not, will have better focus and, and, and more focus in order to offer you know, superior service. Thanks, Marius, for that insight. 
Um, Jonathan, we have another question for you um, from Elijah, who's asking, hi, Jonathan, why did PayFast stop accepting Bitcoin? Yeah, so this was, uh, <laughs> was quite a while ago, actually, uh, kind of interesting to uh, put me in uh, contrast to Luno here. Uh, you know, when we did accept um, Bitcoin for payment on PayFast, we did it with, uh, with, with Luno, which uh, was a great partner. Um, so the reason is really a technical one, and it was something that was done uh, around the world at that time, and, and which I still believe is actually a challenge, is just velocity. Um, you know, Bitcoin is great in, in its decentralized nature, but that comes at a cost, and, and one of those costs is speed. Um, so it takes an incredibly long time relative to, you know, depending on how much you pay to confirm a transaction on the Bitcoin network. You know, whereas if you contrast that to, to doing a card transaction or an EFT, which is a matter of seconds, um, doing the same with Bitcoin is, is minutes, right? Um, you know, and we, we allowed that window to sort of be 10 minutes and even in 10 minutes, it wasn't good enough to receive confirmation of the transaction, right? And that is a structural problem. Um, you know, it, 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 as it stands now, you know, the, the, these this is something that, anyone in crypto, not anyone, but certain parties in crypto are trying to solve and make this faster and improve the velocity. But it's, um, you know, Bitcoin by its nature is very good for slow moving consensus driven transactions. Um, it is not designed for the speed and velocity of a modern payments network. Um, you know, if you contrast, you know, the global, the global capacity of Bitcoin, Morris can correct me if I'm wrong, is probably about five transactions a second at the moment. That's the global capacity. Um, whereas if you take you know, PayPal by themselves is a thousand transactions a second. There's just no way that Bitcoin can compete with um, with a proprietary payment system that's not decentralized. Um, so, you know, that's that's really the challenge. It's 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 a um, it's a logistical one and a technology challenge which people are working on. So let's see what the future holds in this regard. And Marius, on that question, um, I think uh, Jonathan raised quite a few uh, strong points there as to why a person would be reluctant to um, enter the cryptocurrency space. How volatile is cryptocurrency? I mean, we've seen developments like we, I have a lot of friends who say every time Elon Musk is about to open his mouth, uh, we all run the other direction. I mean, we saw how Elon Musk um, sort of stopped accepting Bitcoin payments for Tesla cars. And um, just last week with the developments in China, we saw a $30,000 um, drop in the price of Bitcoin. Is it a very volatile market? And if so, if we're going to enter that space, what, what kind of protection do consumers have? Yes, it is volatile. Uh, Bitcoin is notoriously volatile um, and volatility has been the ongoing theme in the cryptocurrency market across you know, all five, six thousand cryptocurrencies that currently exist. Um, but I think, you know, so, so firstly, if you look at the reasons why Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency prices structure, it's, it's, you know, it's similar reasons you know, to, to you know, similar factors that would typically influence share prices, commodities, et cetera. It's trade wars, it's uh, you know, announcements by regulators, uh, central banks, it's you know, prominent people, influences in the media, you know, making statements, definitely um, security. So there's security hack or this security incident or there's a breach of customer data, uh, you know, that would typically you know, impact customer trust and impact the, the share price of the business. So, so the same factors that move the markets typically also have an impact on crypto. But I think what we've seen in the crypto market over the past two years, you know, is um, first-time investors, especially across emerging markets, you know, coming online, entering the space. And it's probably uh, it's young people, and they probably only own cryptocurrencies, no other investments, and they do all of their research online. You know, they use online resources that follow people such as Elon Musk. Um, and when there's a controversial statement, or when there's a, a trigger event then fear, um, uncertainty and doubt kicks in, right? And, and these retail investors um, sell because they think the price will keep going down. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, you have a, a very volatile market. Um, and we've been through, through this cycle, I think 15 or 16 times over the past couple of years, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. And surprisingly, if you zoom out, you will see that the volatility actually has come down you know, compared, to, compared to previous years. I think it's a it's a it's it's a no it, it's a state we in currently in the market. The crypto market is still relatively 
tiny compared to gold, for example. Gold, you know, it's roughly 5% the size of the gold market. So, so when you have these investors reacting on news events, um, the impact on cryptocurrency and the size of the market will be more severe compared to what the impact would be, you know, typically on gold, for example. So I think it's an ongoing challenge. I think as more people start to, uh, you know, enter the, the market and, and hold, um, I think the volatility should come down. It's not going to be magic. It's going to take time uh, for the market to mature. Um, and so my advice to, to, to first time, you know, entrance into the space with a new invest or speculate you know i think the first thing obviously and, and you know we say this over and over again is you know, don't invest money that you can't afford to lose um and, and that's 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 very true and also the price of bitcoin is not only guaranteed to go up um contrary to public belief it's you no know, it, it can and will also come down so people should really take note of that but if you want to invest you know some people follow strategies like dollar cost averaging where you buy on a monthly basis, people do this with ETFs and unit trusts as well, right? It's a common technique to uh, to average out you know, your, your cost price. So a lot of people on Luna actually do it on a monthly basis around payday, they you know they've got a debit order that goes off and, and, and they you know they invest at certain intervals. And over time, you know, you catch the lows, you catch the highs, and you your your, your average cost price actually you know is is in line. Yeah, so but it is a it's a problem and it's a you no know, it, it's something that um, you know scares a lot of potential investors um, and it's one of the risks of, of the market. Thanks, Marius. I think you highlighted very well um, how people can safeguard against that. I mean, even stock prices have some degree of volatility and there's ways to guard against that. Um, I just want to remind our speakers that we will be closing off at quarter past seven. So um, we technically have about nine more minutes for questions. So if you do have any other questions that you'd like to direct to, to Jonathan or Marius, now is the opportune time. Um, but Marius, um, coming back to what you were saying, um, or well, let me say the critique that Jonathan gave um, in terms of the um, payment speed of Bitcoin, are there other cryptocurrencies that would process faster when it comes to payments or are they more or less all the same? Yeah, you get different cryptos for, for different use cases and um, you get payment tokens such as XRP, um, XRP transactions settle, I think, in three to five seconds. You know? So, so, um, so definitely, um, Bitcoin at this stage, I think, is you know, it's more widely used or seen as an asset, and we're definitely in an asset phase. Although the original you know, intention was for Bitcoin to serve to act as a peer-to-peer -peer payment network, I think it can still do that. I think we've had um, uh, certain innovations in the, in the market, such as a Lightning Network um, that can definitely in future bring down um, the cost and ensure faster transactions. But I think right now, Bitcoin is being used as a as a more more as a um, as an investment or as an asset. And I think we're still in the asset phase. And I think we will probably still be in the asset phase for the next five to ten years. Um, but that's why you have other coins um, um, like Litecoin, for example, which is often referred to as Bitcoin's little little brother. Um, that that that's that's better, you know, for payments and similar, you know, XRP as, as I mentioned. So um, a lot of businesses have thought of using these cryptocurrencies for for payments instead of instead of Bitcoin because it makes more sense. Thanks, thanks, Marius. And then coming back to Jonathan, as we're we're going to slowly start concluding. I just want to get an idea from you as, um, you know, having uh, walked this journey with PayFast, how did you ensure that um, PayFast continues to innovate and continues to remain relevant in such a, you know, um, a, a, an industry that's continuously developing and there's a lot of changes and um, regulations um, around that area? How did you make sure that you continue to remain relevant? Look, I think it's uh, it's kind of a challenge for uh, for anyone in uh, in fintech. Uh, is uh, you, you know got to keep with the times. Uh, uh, you know, funny enough, I mean, we've been around for 
14, 14 odd years now and, and things have changed in, in, in that time frame. I mean, but, you know, if you look in a long enough timeline in terms of banks and other financial institutions, that's nothing, that's a drop in the ocean, right? Um, but I think it is important to um, to keep tabs on what's happening in the market, to continue innovating. I think that, uh, you know, Payfast as a business has always been pretty good in that regard. Um, you know, when we started accepting Bitcoin many, many years ago, it, we were one of the first payment gateways in the world actually to do that. And it got picked up globally. So, you know, that was a very good, uh, very good move on our part, uh, just, you know, in terms of, of innovation, good exposure. Um, so I just think it's, it's something you build into the culture, right? Um, about constantly wanting to improve things, to change things, to to uh, to find out what works, you know. But obviously, being sensible about it, um, and I think it's just something you breed into into startup mentality, really, um, and try not to become too state and too corporate. Um, but yeah, keep tabs in the market. Don't become complacent in in your position, and uh, yep, yeah, keep keep innovating, keep keep searching for uh, for what's uh, what's happening and 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 what might be um, you know something new. I think that. The um, the place for for certain businesses who act as intermediaries, such as as Payfos does, there will always be um, a position. It doesn't matter whether it's um, a credit card you're accepting or an EFT or Bitcoin or Litecoin. It actually doesn't really make any difference, right? At the end of the day, you know what what payment companies like ours do is connect um, consumers to merchants. Uh, now, yes, there could be an argument made that that it's not you know maybe at some point it, it becomes not necessary, but there there's always um, space for that in terms of technology in terms of you know the different systems that are involved there's always middleware that is that is needed to to process these things uh, yeah so thanks jonathan for that um and we have a question um my goodness we've got three questions i'm going to try cram them into one um for marius and then we will then go back to concluding statements. Um, but Marius, so this question says, in the news this week, it was reported that sending crypto to wallets domiciled overseas could be considered a crime. Is there any pressure for Luna to restrict users doing this? Um, and perhaps when you round off that question, maybe then you can just, um, touch on how does one go about investing when you're beginning, um, when you're entering the cryptocurrency space for the first time, maybe just two quick tips for beginners. Okay, I would love to answer the second question first. Um, uh, but yeah, so I think it's, uh, you know, obviously, obviously on the, in the media this week, um, at, um, I think in my broadband, there was, a, there was an article saying that if you send crypto from South African based crypto platforms cross border, then, then, then you know, it's potentially criminal offence. I think we need to look at the Reserve Bank's position paper that they published a couple of weeks ago. And, and in that paper, they, they, they very clearly state the intention, and that is that they will focus on the buying of cryptocurrency. So when you buy crypto, you will, you know, in South Africa with, 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 with ZAR, you will then use your, your SDA. So similar to when you buy dollars through the Shift app or when you buy gold or, or you know, any other uh, asset that's deemed foreign currency, um, you will actually use your SDA. So, so that is the, the plan. You know, that's, that, that's the position that the central bank will, 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 will most likely implement. And the result of that is that what happens after the fact that you send crypto you know, after you've purchased it, then it, it becomes irrelevant because you've already declared your, your, your crypto through the purchase um, and, and you've used your SDA or your foreign investment allowance of 11 million rand. So, so this is a... Uh, it, it's a it's it's an interesting statement or quote. Um, it was published in Reserve Bank's FAQ. Um, it has created some uncertainty, and at this point, we're just engaging with the central bank, with Reserve Bank, to understand you know, the reason behind that and, and to understand whether we need to take any action. But certainly, you now what we've been doing, we've been consulting with them you now for for a good couple of years. We've been you know, and, and they've been very good at involving the industry um, in the in the in their discussions, and um, we are. You know, we preparing ourselves, you know, for what they've declared in the position paper. You know, so, so that, that is our focus. Um, and the second question, I think, you know, um, you know, when you when you're not in crypto yet, I think the first thing you should do is, you know, you should go to the Linux learning portal on Linux Linux app or on the website. Uh, you need to familiarize yourself with you know, the risks. And, and I only want to talk about the risk. There are many, many positives as well. But if you're a first time buyer, I think what you should do is you know, familiarize yourself um, with, with you know, the basics. 
And when you start, when you consider putting money into it, start small. And you know you can buy crypto from as little as one rand. So put in 10 rand, get to know the platform, um, you know, have skin in the game, monitor the price, understand what impacts the price or not. Um, and I saw another question asking, is Bitcoin safe or not and as an investment? And I think that depends on our law circumstances if you if safe to you mean means that in six months you must have your capital guaranteed then it's not because the bitcoin price will fluctuate and it will go up and down and in six months time you may have you know less than six of your investment so i think start small start slow, start with 10 20 you know 30 rand um, and that way you will you know force yourself to learn a bit more and to understand stand the basics better Thank you, Marius. So we're going to now close, unfortunately, and maybe um, Marius will answer Grant's question in his closing statement. I'm first going to um, go back to Jonathan so that he can close for tonight. Um, sadly, it was announced that Jonathan has resigned from PayFast. So in your closing statements, please just let us know um, what the future looks like for you going forward um, and what we can expect to see from you. Um, and then, yeah, I'll come back to Marius after that. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Sinclair. Um, no, I don't really want necessarily want to, want to close on that, but I, I suppose thanks everyone for joining us and having a, a bit of a fireside chat around things crypto and fintech. Uh, yeah, I mean, as Sinclair says, uh, it, it was publicly announced on Friday that I'll be moving on. Uh, very sad, mixed emotions, all the rest of it. I, I can't say that there's anything uh, specific that I'll be focusing on in, in, the, in the next while, but um, I love technology, I love payments, uh, e-com, retail, you know, it's something that's in my blood. Um, but I do need to take a little bit of a break. Uh, it's been a, a long journey um, and uh, I haven't taken a proper holiday in probably over a decade, although COVID has restricted that a little bit. But um, yeah, I think it's time to just take a breather, spend a little bit of time focusing on personal life. I will uh, spend a bit of time on one or two other business ventures that I'm involved in um, and then we'll see what the future holds. Uh, but yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining tonight and uh, I, hopefully I'll do a few more of these before I'm, I'm officially, uh, you know, no longer um, MD of Payfast. Uh, so look forward to, to one or two more, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. I, I personally learned a lot from you um, this evening. Um, and Marius, even though you've technically been answering this question, uh, there was a question regarding a SARS regulation. Um, Hang on, I seem to have lost my question. <laughs> um, but basically, whether SARS was keeping a close eye, um, I think you've answered that from an exchange control perspective, but maybe you can just reassure people um, on st SARS's stance when it comes to cryptocurrency. Um, and then just in closing, let us know um, uh, where Luno stands, what we can expect going forward, and if you've got any words of wisdom for people looking to invest in cryptocurrency. <laughs> uh, keeps on coming back to the investment side of things. Um, so on SARS, so SARS actually made it a lot easier for people to uh, to add the cryptocurrency gains to the tax return. So on the tax return, uh, when you do your tax return now in the next tax season, there's actually a category where you can declare crypto gains, crypto losses. Um, so they've said it a couple of occasions that if you trade crypto or if you invest and you realize a gain or a loss, that must be declared. Um, and so, so I think that's the most important point. Um, I think in future when regulations come to the market, um, exchange, exchanges and platforms will, will likely have to integrate with, with SARS similar to our banks and financial institutions currently do to report uh, you know, capital gains and interest, et cetera. So I think the, the, the key point there is, yes, you have to declare your taxes and um, you're either declared as part of your income if you're a trader, um, and if you're an investor, you, your intention is to hold for the long term, then um, you know, it'll fall under capital gains or capital losses. No, and I think, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for this session. Uh, it, was, it was great joining. Um, our, uh, you know, our, our, our long-term vision is to upgrade the world to a better financial system, but you know, that's not what we're doing right now. We, we, we you know, focused on making it as safe and as easy as possible for people to access cryptocurrencies you know, as, as the first step. We think that uh, money will continue to, to, to evolve, you know, as we've seen many times happen in the past. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, the only constant in this process is change. So we are building the bridge between 
the current financial system and a future financial system. Um, and uh, we're just trying to make it as, as safe and easy as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marius and Jonathan, for joining us this evening. And to everyone who crossed platforms to come and indulge in this conversation, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. From our team at Heavy Chef, thank you for supporting us. Look out for more events. And we have recorded this session. So if you've got friends, family that missed out on tonight, they will be able to catch up. So um, from my side, have a lovely evening. It was lovely interacting with all of you. Thank you for the liberating and enlightening questions. Have a lovely evening and keep safe. Oh, thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.